A reason that I'm resisting choosing one of these six visions of goodness is that none of them seem truly to line up with the Christian story of goodness. Are any of these six visions of goodness really the Christian story of goodness? Even Platonism, which comes as close as any to capturing the loyalties of Christians over the centuries, seems to have enough of a different emphasis that it's derailed our understanding of the future and therefore our understanding of the present. What is the Christian story of goodness? To understand a story, it helps to know the story's beginning. Old Testament Israel's life and the testimony of that in God's Word in the Bible displays shades of each of these visions of goodness, but not very successfully. No one of these visions of goodness seems to deliver what God has promised to Israel. When we look at Israel's moral life in the scriptures, we see appeals to all six of these visions. A goodness gets mindset is present in the way that the Torah rewards good behavior. If Israel, you want the blessings of this covenant, obey these rules and regulations. Well, that is a goodness gets mindset. Those rewards aren't just incentives, they are the blessings of the good life. So goodness isn't just a means, goodness is the goal or the end to which God is trying to point his people. Covenant rewards as blessings of the good life embody a goodness results mindset. Both of those things are powerfully at work in the Torah, the first big section of Israel's scriptures. If we look at the other sections, we see more in the writings the Psalms, the Proverbs, the wisdom literature, we see that wisdom brings good and just outcomes. That is a goodness merits outlook. The wisdom that we live by produces the fruits of wisdom, and both are good and to be desired. In the prophets, we see God as the source of Israel's goodness, right? God isn't just Israel's maker. God is Israel's font. God is the source of all that is good for this special people. And the prophets announce that after Israel's failure, Israel will return to Zion, to where God's presence is, to inherit God's goodness. That is something like a goodness returns outlook. But in returning from exile, Israel won't just benefit, Israel will become a channel of God's blessing to what isn't Israel, to all the nations of the earth. Also in the prophets, we see the promise that the Torah will stream from Zion out into the nations. Justice will flow like mighty rivers to God's people, but through God's people to others. And blessing, blessing will overflow Israel and cover the earth. That is a goodness spreads outlook. We even see a goodness expresses itself outlook in the fact that God has chosen Israel as his betrothed. If Song of Songs literally is about ordinary human sexual attraction in marriage, then when God takes up the figure of Israel, his people, as his wife betrothed to himself, he does that in the prophet Hosea and elsewhere, God is affirming his people, their being, their goodness, which, yes, after all, is a gift from him, is also truly theirs. They become a worthy bride, for their divine bridegroom, Yahweh. I find this complexity of visions of goodness both fascinating and truly significant. God's design, God's goodness, cannot be reduced to just one of these six visions. God is up to something that lies beyond any one of these six visions. Well, what could God be up to? The ministry of Jesus Christ shows a similar complexity. God is up to something in Jesus' ministry that seems to lie beyond any one of these six. Aspects of Jesus' teaching and approach in his ministries that you see in the Gospels and in his very words align with each of these perspectives, although imperfectly. He doesn't just fit into each one's slot. He does, however, offer a picture that resembles each one in its own way. And all through the Gospels, really through the whole New Testament, People evaluate Jesus from each of these six perspectives and judge him from those perspectives. In fact, condemn him from those perspectives because he doesn't fit any one of them. He looks like he's a threat to the goodness merits mindset. He looks like he's a threat to the goodness returns mindset if he leads his nation into idolatry and following a false prophet. 
his crucifixion is a showdown between these visions and Jesus, whom they're all trying to judge and condemn. And in his resurrection, God vindicates Jesus over each of them. And yet, aspects of each of these visions of goodness play roles in Jesus' ethic and in Christian ethics. Paul tells the Corinthians, and here he's representing Jesus' teaching, if the work built on the foundation, Jesus would say, on the rock of my word, if it survives, that worker will receive a reward. Well, that resembles a goodness gets ethic. And Jesus has promised that a disciple who sacrifices, who has left family, homes, for the sake of the kingdom, will receive many times more in this age, and in the age to come, a sacrificer like that will receive eternal life. That resembles a goodness results ethic. Jesus teaches something like goodness meriting when he tells his disciples, as you sow, so shall you reap. As you invest, you will reap a return on your investment, whether it's good or bad. We will receive the just deserts of the lives that we've lived. That's not quite karma, but it's close to karma. It's a goodness merit system. I hear a glimmer of goodness returning to its source when, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, when the Son of Man is lifted up, he means on the cross, when he's glorified, he says, I will draw all to myself. That image reminds me of Israel regathering around God's returning glory and the nations streaming to Zion to see God's wisdom on display and to receive the fruit of that richness. That's goodness returning, isn't it? Peter teaches a vision of goodness spreading through church witness in describing the church as a royal priesthood. Now, a good king is a blessing to the whole domain, and Jesus is a good and fruitful king. And we as royals, as members of his royal family, we are, after all, sons of the one father, we spread the blessings of his kingdom where we go. That is a goodness spreads outlook. You see the same dynamic in the fact that we're a royal priesthood. Priests are agents of blessing, restoration, and building up of the whole people. If the church is a priesthood, then the church's priestly role is to spread God's blessings beyond their own numbers to those around them. You see the same sentiment in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus calls his disciples the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Their purpose is to be a showcase of his kingdom in front of others, even at the cost of them being noticed and persecuted for the sake of that righteousness. Finally, Jesus affirms something like a goodness expresses ethic when he tells his disciples, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, whether good or bad. He is saying that what we say reflects who we are. We express ourselves, and what we express is either light or darkness. In Matthew 12, Jesus tells his crowds that something greater than the temple is present, something greater than Solomon, something greater than Jonah, in him, the kingdom of God. These aspects of multiple visions of goodness demonstrate that something greater than any one of them is present in Jesus' kingdom and ministry. This begs a question, if all six of these visions of goodness, and probably more, are aspects of something greater than themselves, then how do we get to that greater thing? What does it consist of? Is it just the sum total of all six? That's easy, but too easy, right? Because goodness can't merely be an end and also merely be a means and also be both and also be in the fog as well as above the fog. So I think it's going to be too easy to say that these six visions are incomplete and you really just need to hold them all together if you're going to get the sense of what's greater in Jesus's presence. No, I think what's greater with Jesus is something beyond any of the six and beyond all of the six. I think we need to start with Israel and Jesus and work back from there. We need to look at the goodness that's on display in what God is doing in his people, particularly in the ministry of Jesus Christ, and build a fuller, more robust vision of goodness from those building blocks. Because we're no longer starting from our own cultural instincts or our own philosophical presuppositions. Instead, we're starting with the actual concrete history of what God has done and what God demonstrates about himself in doing it. Let me show you what I mean by just looking finally at the word goodness, which I've been using all up until now. What is goodness? Well, if you look in a dictionary, 
you'll find the ordinary meanings of the word. Desirability, approval, suitability to a task, pleasure, satisfaction, which is deeper than pleasure, but they're similar, advantage, one's own advantage, or benefit. All of these definitions relate to the way we use goodness to describe purpose. Something is suitable to my purpose, then it's good. Something is pleasurable, it's good. If something receives the approval, my own or others, it's good. These are all ordinary ways that we use the word goodness to describe a purpose that's external to a thing. There are other senses of the word goodness which refer to something internal to the thing, intrinsic being of a thing, its own righteousness, its rightness, or its justice, or its virtue, its excellence, or its perfections, the way that it realizes its own potential. We use the word good or goodness for all of these qualities which inhere in a thing. So our ordinary uses of the word goodness or the word good refer to either qualities that are internal, that inhere in a thing, that make it good, or purposes, suitabilities, goals outside the thing that make that thing well suited to it. In the story of Jesus, those ordinary uses of goodness lead right up to him, but then in him they meet their limit. We see this kind of transformative encounter happen in Matthew 19, in the story of the rich young man. Behold, a man came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? In the way this young man has phrased the question, you could hear a hint of a goodness gets mindset, or better yet, a goodness merits mindset. What good thing will yield eternal life? But Jesus said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. Jesus points the young man and everyone in the audience beyond intrinsic being and extrinsic purpose to a person, a who, God alone. Now that doesn't violate a goodness returns mindset, right? Platonism says the ultimate goodness is God alone. From a Platonist perspective, this doesn't seem out of line. Jesus is saying God, the one above all, is the source of all that's good. And Jesus goes on to associate goodness, the thing, as well as the one, and God, and ends, and means, all together in a package called the kingdom of God, or the reign of God. After Jesus' exchange with the young man, in which the young man leaves because he's not willing to part with all the good things he has, Jesus tells his disciples, truly, I tell you, only with great difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of God. In Matthew, he calls it the kingdom of heaven because he wants to associate God and the center of power from which God rules. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. On the one hand, in this passage, Jesus firmly roots goodness in God alone. One there is, who is good. But then he goes on to develop how the goodness of God alone flows through his kingdom into those who inherit it. The kingdom of God, therefore, is a key framework for understanding goodness as Jesus wants to teach it. It supplies the frame in which all the other aspects of goodness, earnings, results, merit, return, spread, and expression, all find coherent places, places where they don't compete with each other, where they don't contradict each other, but where they have been, you might say, normed or framed by God alone. 